All right, guys. Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron, and welcome to the Trial Site News podcast. And today, our guest is Dr. Audrey Dion. Thank you so much, Audrey, for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, and for our viewers, we're going to talk about a topic that has been in the news quite a bit, which is myocarditis after uh, getting the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine in the pediatric population. Audrey did a study on it and she's gonna talk about that study. But um, first, Audrey, do you mind just telling our viewers a little bit about who you are and the type of work you do? Sure, I'm one of the pediatric cardiologists here at Boston Children. Uh, with the onset of the pandemic, I've been part of a small group caring for patients with COVID-19, MISC, and then more recently myocarditis after the vaccine. So I read your study, you got published in JAMA Cardiology, great journal. Um, so you, it was a case series, so a small group of people, but can you talk about, I guess, a little bit about the methods of your study and who you included in that study? Yeah, so we looked at all of our patients who presented with chest pain and elevated troponin, which is a marker for the muscle of the art or inflammation of the art uh, after receiving the COVID vaccine. As this was a relatively new phenomenon, our goal was to describe who were these patients, how did they present, and what was their clinical course, both in the hospital and on early follow-up. Uh, we also reviewed all the, re the result of all their cardiac testing, including electrocardiograms, so recording of the electricity of the art, echocardiograms, which are which is the ultrasound of the art, and then cardiac MRI as well. Okay, so what were some of the results that you guys found? So we found that most cases of myocarditis occurred in male teenagers. Um, they typically presented with chest pain. And then about half of the patient had other symptoms, which included fever, myalgia, or like diffuse muscle pain, um, headache, and fatigue. All our patients had elevated troponin, which kind of implies some inflammation or injury to the art, and then mildly elevated inflammatory marker. They were all admitted to the hospital and on average for two days. Uh, half of the patients were treated with IVIG and steroids, which are medication to try to decrease the inflammation of the art. And the patients who were treated were those who were sicker or had abnormal cardiac testing. Um, the EKG were abnormal in the majority of our patients, presenting with some changes of the ST segment and T wave inversion. And when we looked at the echocardiogram, the systolic ventricular function or the squeezing of the art was normal in most. We had three patients out of 15 that had abnormal ventricular function. Although when we used more sensitive measurements like strain, we found abnormalities in more patients and about a third of them. And then all of our patients had cardiac MRI within a week of their diagnosis and late gadolinium enhancement was found in 12 out of 15 patient and most often in the inferior lateral region. Okay, so you guys really did a kind of specific study of all of those heart measures, um, which, which is great um, for, for collecting data and learning more about this. I wanted to read something from your paper that you guys wrote, which was, um, although vaccine associated cases of myocarditis to date have had uncomplicated short-term courses, the long-term prognosis remains unclear. So can you elaborate a little bit on that statement? Yeah, so as, as with everything COVID, I think a lot of this is new and we learn as we go along. We try to extrapolate from our prior experience, but also realizing it may or may not apply. Um, so the myocarditis we see after COVID vaccine seems to be milder than other forms of myocarditis, which most often occur with the viral infection. And then those patients with myocarditis from other causes than the vaccine typically have more severe cardiac involvement and require ICU admission. Um, so it was reassuring to see that all patients had fairly minimal symptom at the time of presentation and could be discharged home within 48 hours. That being said, we still don't know whether this episode of inflammation of the art will leave sequela in the future. Um, we know that other, those other forms of myocarditis, some of them will have persistent ventricular dysfunction or scar that can cause arrhythmia in the future. 
And then that's where the late Gadolinium Yem enhancement that we see, it can represent scarring of the eye. Uh, that being said, when we see it very acutely, when the patient first presents, it can also just represent the inflammation. So we need to follow up those patients and see, it, does that late Gadolinium enhancement resolve, which would point towards uh, being something more acute and transient inflammation. That being said, if it persists, it would imply a scar and we would have to see what that can clinically mean for our patient. So they presented very different acutely as what we typically know for myocarditis. So I don't think we can extrapolate that they will do the same long-term as our myocarditis and whether they will do better or worse, I think that's yet to see. Okay, so to, to summarize this a little bit, there might be long-term consequences because there could be scarring or inflammation in the heart um, that creates, and you use the word arrhythmia, which is um, the heart beats abnormally, or, right? Like just, I'm trying to put it in like uh, uh, general, general terms. Um, and you're saying that we don't know that yet. So, I mean, and I know, and I believe in your paper, you did follow up your uh, patients for a certain amount of time, but that's kind of, I mean, if I was a parent, that would be concerning. I mean, how long should somebody be followed up? Um, yeah. I think you're right. I think when most people hear myocarditis, they think of something severe and they think something that may have long-term consequences and patients that need to be followed by cardiology for uh, the years to come. Um, I think that being said is this may be very different for the post-vaccine myocarditis. And we still don't know whether we need to have all the same concern that we have for other patients with myocarditis or whether this will be something more benign. Um, so I think that's a big part of the concern and kind of the discussion that has been around this subject is because we worry it may be more severe, but I think uh, following up those patients closely and making sure we, we don't lose them is going to be the only way to, to really know what happened. The, the vaccine was approved in May for the use in teenager. So we're kind of getting at the three month follow up mark um, for those patients. And so far, at least anecdotally, people have been doing much better. And, um, but I think we still need more than three months to really know what it means long term. Right, right. And this is something too that wasn't detected in the clinical trial, right? This is, yeah. That's correct. And, and part of it is, it is very rare, right? That's, I feel like that's all that we talk about and that's all that we hear about, but it is 0.06% of teenage male. And if we take that number for all teenager, it's much, much lower than that. So clinical trials will only enroll so many patients. Uh, so I think they just didn't have the the numbers to see it. And that's why even when vaccines are approved or new medication are approved, it's important to keep following up what happens after. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's part of the whole experimental process is, you know, if it hits the market or the population, it's important to follow up. Um, I wanted to ask you, you touched on rates of myocarditis in this population. There are reports of after getting infected with COVID-19, um, you also, the kids can also in this population end up with myocarditis. Is there any data on how common that is versus myocarditis caused by the COVID-19 vaccine approved for that population? Yeah, it, it's difficult to obtain numbers that compare both directly, but we know that the, both COVID-19 infection and MISC, which is a complication we see mostly in children, seems to affect the art fairly often. Um, and so both children and adults have frequent involvement of the art with COVID-19, whether or not they have symptoms of it. Uh, we know that from testing, they can have those elevated troponin as well. And there's also been a lot of, at least in the news about screening athletes before return to sport, even though they were not very sick with COVID because of that same concern of myocarditis. So most of the evidence suggests that the risk of myocarditis with COVID is actually much higher than with the vaccine. Um, the patients with myocarditis after COVID are also much sicker, requiring ICU care and longer admission uh, to the, in the hospital. So 
despite myocarditis being a concern after vaccination, it still seems like the benefit of the vaccine outweigh the risk. And that's why the recommendation is still to vaccinate all teenagers, although we're constantly reevaluating that as more information is available. Right, right. And it's, it's an important population to do that and uh, really have to make sure that um, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and I know a lot of parents are struggling with this choice right now. Um, I wanted to ask my last question here that I wrote down. Um, so in VAERS, the most cases, and correct me if I'm wrong, most cases of myocarditis reported to the adverse effects reporting system that we use are in males, 12 to 17 years old. Um, and one of the limitations that was listed in your study was that we may be missing mild cases of myocarditis. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so if, even through our study or even the registry, we're capturing patients who complain of symptoms after the vaccine. So they said they had chest pain and then they got more testing and that's how we identified them. It's possible that some patients had some mild inflammation of the heart, but never knew about it because they never had any symptom. So the only way to really know about all those patients would be to test everyone who gets vaccinated. Um, that being said, I'm not sure we, we need to do that either. Seems like even the patients who presented with symptoms and were found to have inflammation of the heart seems to have done very well. And we haven't, it's, so it seems very unlikely that patients without symptoms would do worse than those that we know about. Uh, we also haven't had any patients come back a few weeks later with kind of cardiac event that we think could be attributed to the vaccine or this myocarditis that wasn't identified initially. Um, thank you again, Audrey, for sharing your study with us, your expertise. Um, are you guys doing any more research on this? Any more follow-up in this area? Yes, yeah, so I think we're going to continue to follow our patient and we're going to plan to repeat their cardiac MRI three to six months after their diagnosis to see whether or not there is a we need to worry about the scar that would be present long term or if those initial findings get better and go away, um, which is our goal. Um, and we're continue to um, identify all patients. And I know there's multiple ongoing multi-center collaboration so that all centers put their rare cases together so we can have larger number and, and get more information on that subject, hopefully so that we can guide recommendation and decisions that parents have to make about vaccine. Yeah, definitely, because it's an interesting time right now with you know vaccine mandates, especially this population, um, and then this question of boosters in the future, and is there gonna be a cumulative effect? I mean, there's a lot of things we just don't know. Um, but when you do, if you do do that study, please share, uh, send it to me at trial site because um, we'd love to see it. I'd love to share it with our viewers. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, you know, lots of people are really um, concerned about this particular subject. But um, thanks for all the work you've been doing, taking care of COVID patients. I know it's not easy, and um, I hope you come back on the show. Uh, at a future date. And to all our trial site news podcast watchers, thanks for joining in for your comments. Hope you subscribe. Hope uh, you got some value for this. Always enjoy hearing from you guys too. Take care. Thanks, Audrey. That was a, a little you. awkward because it's like a little bit of acting <laughs> tied in with yeah. trying to say, <laughs> like wanting to say goodbye to you too. But um, thank you so much. I really appreciate sure. it. That was very helpful. And um, I'm serious. Yeah. If you do uh, publish the, you know, the, the next round of studies, please let me know. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> All right. Enjoy the rest of your day up there in Boston. And hopefully you get some, uh, relaxation time too. Some <laughs> Thank, you. You too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.